Hi, this is Peter Coronius, and I'm here on the other side of the camera tonight, interviewing my friend and long-term colleague, Alex zakharov Royt, who is going to talk to us tonight about his experiences of the internet as we move closer to the 30th anniversary celebrations of the internet in Australia. So Alex, where did it all begin for you? Well, it was 1979, my father bought me my first computer. I was four and a half years old. But this is my 40th year in technology. And, uh, you know, I still remember getting my first 300 board modem. This was from the uh, hardware library of one of the user groups that I was a member of. And uh, I still remember going, I used to dream of a 9600 board. Netcom had this 9600 board modem. We had the Hayes AT command set. And I went from 300 to 1200, 24. I went straight then to 14.4 kilo, you know, kilobits per second, uh, 28.8, 33.6, 56. I remember the progressive you know, nature of the images that would come down and when you would get a faster modem, it would load faster. And you know, even that whistling sound, <whistles> as uh, we got better and better modems. And you know, if that little shh went for too long, you had to hang up and dial again. And that was 25 cents a call at the time. You know, Nowadays we have, uh, you know, plans with gigabytes. I mean, the, the plan that I'm on these days gives me unlimited 4G internet. So we've come a long, long way. And, a long you know, way, yeah. Alex. And can you remember the time that you would call the ISP and the line would be engaged? Yes. And you actually have to wait for a free line. That's right. Before you could log in. They, they, you know, they were trying to uh, provision a certain amount of lines and they had ratios, you know, 100 to 1 or 10 to 1. Yeah, they'd be busy. You couldn't get onto the internet. You know, instant gratification still isn't instant enough for people yeah. today. But yeah. back then you had to wait. Keep redialing, redial, redial. Yeah, we were much more patient then, and though as the internet got faster, it never seemed to be fast enough, did it? Well, and look, it's the same story today. I mean, my uh, relatives in Hong Kong have gigabit connections, and for them, a bad day is about 300 megabits. You mm. know, for us, that'd be an awesome day. I've got a 100 megabit connection at home, but uh, you know, even on our 4G phones, when it's g going a bit slow for whatever reason, we, we feel it. And uh, it's, it's something that, it's like a sixth sense. You know, the internet is uh, so many things to us these days. And us, the speed of our connectivity is very important. Very important. And I was reflecting on this the other day that things, something was taking a little long to load. Mm. I was already five thoughts ahead of where the computer was at. And I realised that the ultimate uh, connectivity speed will be when it is interacting as quickly as your thought. Well, you know, you'd, you'd hope for some sort of wireless connection to the brain rather than having one of Elon Musk's neural links where he's got some sort of thread that's... Uh, being implanted into your brain. I don't quite know if I, I think wireless is the way I'd like to go with that one um, But yes, look internet at the speed of thought uh, Would be something that would be revolutionary today and today we you know uh, I mean in Japan they have two gigabit connections uh, They've got 10 big 10 gigabit connections to certain buildings in Adelaide uh, But of course we have a hundred gigabits a thousand gigabits. I mean, where's it all going to end? Uh, we once used to think or Steve, uh, Steve Jobs Bill Gates used to say that 640k ought to be enough for everybody and boy was he wrong on that front <laughs> someone's actually done a calculation on the um, speed of data processing of the brain the transfer mm. of data in uh, bits per second uh, and it'll be an exponential of that and I, we have to look that up because I think uh, this is fascinating me now mm. is this idea of what is the speed of brain connectivity and the transmission of signals and the more that we can bring technology to to sync with that then the more seamless it will become. And I think that's sort of the holy grail, isn't it? Well, I mean, I hear these ads on the radio about the SAN and they talk about looking after yourself and how your brain has, you know, thousands of gigabytes of computing power and capacity. And they're trying to, you know, equate the brain as though it was a modern computer today. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I always like to remind people that for all our advanced technology, we're still in the black and white era of technology when you can consider what uh, science fiction has dreamt up. And of course, inside of... Um, you know, the uh, science fiction novels, uh, you know, all sorts of neural network brain, you know, interfaces exist. And it's going to be very interesting to see that evolve over the next 10, 20, 30 years, uh, you know, given how exponential our technology is, is growing. Uh, um, and uh, if only our internet speeds truly were as exponential as our imaginations, uh, we'd probably be there already. We would have reached the singularity, do you think? That's it. Ray Kurzweil would be most pleased. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, looking back on, let's say, the last 20 years, when the internet had really become, I think, mainstream, was mm. entering mainstream um, usage, what for you have been the real standouts? 
Well, look, I still remember downloading real audio and real video for the first time, seeing those little postage stamp size things. Now we take 4K streaming for granted um, forever. I'm streaming a bunch of different things. I mean, a lot of people will be watching this via a stream of some sort. Uh, so, you know, just the instant access to super high quality uh, video, you know, when I was a kid, we would see these things about the video conferencing. Well, we now take it for granted. In fact, some people don't want to do video conferencing because they, oh, I don't want to be seen, you know, my things are not right or whatever it might be. You know, I used to use my Nokia N95. I used to try and use that the way I use an iPhone today. I'd have Gmail, I'd have surfing the web, and, you know, I'd have to push and click, and now it's all effortless. I mean, I used to dream of uh, the three-dimensional graphics and the, the, the systems we have today, when I had a black and white TV with an RCA connector plugged into that Exidy Sorcerer computer from 1979. And I knew that when I was a kid, as the navigator for dad, that one day we'd have these little boxes that would be giving us all the directions and maps. And we have that with GPS. And the kids today have grown up with that as normal. I mean, you know, kids today don't know what it's like to live in a world pre-technology, unless we have a blackout. You know, for us growing up, it was when the electricity went out or when the water stopped. And even today, of course, that's shocking for us. But the internet is just an everyday part of our lives. And I wonder if I ever will have children, how you know, you're going to limit their access to technology so that they're not you know, addicted to it the way we see kids today with Fortnite and these other games where they're just so addicted to, to technology. Mm. But you know, I was introduced at a young age. Tiger Woods was introduced to golf at three. I mean, if I don't introduce whatever future kids I have to technology at a young age, and I have a low tech household like Steve Jobs and others, was said to have had, mm. you know, is that going to handicap the, f the next generation or is that going to be a benefit of benefit to them? Mm. You know, these are things we're still figuring out. We are, aren't we? We're grappling with these questions of deeper issues around humanity and technology, I think, have always been a preoccupation of mine. And I remember in the early 2000s, the late 90s, considering what this whole revolution meant. And for me, it always came back to the human. Mm. For me, personally, and, and in the days of the AA. We used to say um, it's not a revolution unless everybody's involved. Mm. So these issues of inclusiveness, of keeping our humanity in the face of this ubiquitous and overwhelming technology. But I want to ask you another question related to that. Mm. Uh, in 2001, I think it was, we built an island in Second Life, the AAA, mm -hmm. and it was a bit of an experiment. And the board gave us full permission to spend, you know, what limited resources we had on developing. Uh, an amazing thing and a guy called David Baines who was on our board spent over a hundred hours of programming and I came in and did some finishing touches you know mm. from a design I was able to create my own office and I had Persian carpets and surfboards hanging on the wall and it was extremely cool and it was a virtual world it was you know, one of the first and of course it was very clunky and laggy and the resolution was you know jerky and but it was fully graphical it wasn't, wasn't a text -based. And, and we held the first ever legal conference in a 3d virtual world mm. in the AAA auditorium uh, that we created and there were lawyers coming in from California I remember in as chicken avatars yep. strange birds but there was, it was all VoIP enabled mm -hmm. and we could actually have conversations and I remember giving a PowerPoint presentation on legal issues of 3D virtual worlds in 2001 mm -hmm. and so what what struck me at the time was that you very quickly in that environment start to uh, adapt to the fact that you are actually fully immersive just as we adapt to an image that isn't perfectly resolved, mm. we, somehow we can accommodate that. And I started to have this idea that one day we wouldn't be on the internet, we would be in the internet. Mm. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, that's one of the promises and one of the worries of the internet. Uh, there already have been science fiction movies about people who put headsets on and they just live their, world, uh, live their lives in virtual worlds. Of course, Ready Player One is a famous book and movie that came out recently but there was a Bruce Willis movie called Surrogates mm. where they you know they had people living sitting in chairs and putting on headsets and actually instead of it being virtual they actually had robots who were living in the real world but they were interacting with them so look it's a very real thing I mean already I've remember stories over the past decade of uh, people in South Korea where they have very advanced uh, internet compared to what we had in, at the same time frame and there was a young couple that was spending more time looking after their virtual baby than their real one who sadly had passed away mm. so we are, and we have had stories of people who've spent days in front of a computer in internet cafes drinking energy drinks who then uh, subsequently have had have heart attacks and die mm. but these are very real things very real worries uh, the old um, you know adage that everything in moderation has never been more true in the modern era and if your kids are stuck in front of a computer or a smartphone, you know, go and get a football and 
go and kick out, kick the ball outside and don't let the kids get into that sort of situation in the first place. There is some wisdom in uh, Steve Jobs and other tech CEOs uh, wanting to employ low tech households. Um, and finding the balance between the two is something that uh, we're still, as you said, as you said before, grappling with. Mm. But, um, you know, I, I've played with those virtual reality headsets and I'm looking forward more than virtual reality. I'm looking forward to augmented reality. Right. Because augmented reality can blank out the real world and become virtual if you want. But, you know, we spend most of our time in the real world, not the virtual, even though you would say the internet is the virtual world. But as we walk around, I mean, you might remember Johnny Mnemonic and some of those movies mm. with Keanu Reeves, and they were interacting with the internet like this. Well, when you have a virtual headset on, you know, uh, or an augmented reality headset, and I'm looking at you, for example, I can have popping up on the side of, of, the, uh, of your face that uh, the name of your children, the name of your partner, information about you that I shouldn't forget, a little bit like we saw in Terminator, the very mm -hmm. first movie. And that sort of augmentation, uh, the melding of the real world and the digital world in right in front of my eyes, I mean, that's what's coming next. That's why Apple is working on its glasses. That's why Google tried to have the glass. That's why right. Facebook spent billions on Oculus. Mm. And some melding, some you know, living part of our world virtually and living part of our world in augmented reality is what the 20... 20s to the 2030s, I imagine, is going to be all about. And where will our privacy be then? Well, I mean, we were discussing before, what would it be like to live in a world that uh, doesn't have any privacy? And I said, well, I think that's called 2019. You know? mm, mm. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan famously said that we should not, you know, liberty is not passed down through the, through the bloodstream and we need, every generation needs to fight to pass it on to the next. And it's exactly the same with privacy. One of the things we're seeing in iOS 13 is a notification when a certain app wants to know your location and they're doing that not because you have location services on with your GPS but because they're able to triangulate your position from Bluetooth and from Wi-Fi and apparently that's been happening for years with governments uh, with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth hotspots that are not for passing on information but for tracking you in even things like stoplights or as you're driving around so you know I think I mean, we even see Google talking and Facebook, although nobody believes Facebook, but Google and Facebook talking about privacy. And we have Apple as well, who've always been long for that. And I think this next decade, there's going to be a real resurgence back to that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to lose our humanity and just become robots, you know, with uh, some sort of chip implanted in us. And we'll become part of some Borg, some hive mind, and that'll be the end of humanity. That's where the story will stop. And we have to take the blue pill and believe whatever we want to believe rather than the red pill and wake up. <laughs> and uh, be the masters of the future and not its slaves. That's the challenge, isn't it? Now, Alex, we'll, we'll be talking about some of these issues at our 30th anniversary celebrations, mm -hmm. which is in just over five weeks from now. Now, you'll be there in all your resplendent glory. Uh, well, I'll and... be filming it and streaming it live to the internet through my 4G connection on my phone. And... Unless the Dolphin House has a high-speed connection, I'll use that as well. Yeah, but we're yeah. super excited about this event. So tell us what you're looking forward to on the night. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing the stories from uh, some of the panellists and some of the people just simply there to tell us about their greatest moments uh, on the internet in 30 years, where they think it has gone right, where they think it's gone wrong, where they think it will be in the future. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for people to come up to one of my uh, phones on a tripod and they can share some of their thoughts. We're going to have all of this recorded uh, and preserved at the 30 Eye Gala website. But clearly, to be there, to be there with the tech luminaries, with policymakers, with entrepreneurs, you know, with with all the people that are going to be there, it's going to be a fantastic night. And I just just to talk to the people and to watch the things unfold, to remember some of the fallen heroes of the internet, mm. and to look to the future is going to be a great thing. And I I wouldn't miss it for the world. And I hope the people that are watching are going to want to come to and, and share in it and be part of history. That's a fantastic sort of endorsement, Alex. I was just thinking as you were saying that, wouldn't it be cool if we could capture what people thought of on the night as what the future will be like mm. and somehow put that in a time capsule and 30 years from now, we could do the, other, the next event, the 60 <laughs> years anniversary and look back at what we thought today mm. about what the internet was going to be just like to, um, at the event we're going to be i'll be certainly sharing some of my uh, ideas on what i thought 20 years ago the internet was going to be like today mm. Mm. and how well have we actually realized that dream and what were some of the unexpected things that have come along that no no one really anticipated well i mean we, we see from the jetsons that we should have had uh, apartments floating in the sky with uh, effortless you know cars that could fly we have we have cars that can fly but they're not 
you know, something that anyone can buy. Robots were meant to be everywhere and we're only at the cusp of the very beginning of that happening. So, I mean, there's a famous saying from Arthur C. Clarke, from Bill Gates, from uh, Futurists that, you know, we overestimate what will happen in uh, the short term or in a couple of years and we underestimate what will happen you know, over the longer term or in 10. And so, you know, I just hope that uh, we are still here, stronger than ever, more technologically advanced than ever, and we haven't uh, ended civilization in some sort of nuclear, environmental, financial, or uh, technological catastrophe. But I'm an optimist. I like to think that science fiction is a warning of what to look out for and a predictor of great things to come. Right. And yeah, having a time capsule. I mean, even if we're not here for whatever reason, it can be captured and it can be shared by whoever is doing the 60th anniversary. And that would be a great thing to do. And I think there'll be a lot of great ideas and we should be sharing them and capturing them. And we have the technology to do it. And even this video that we're doing right now can be part of that record. Hello in 2060, <laughs> 2050. All right, now I'm going to test you with one curly question to sure. end off. Do you remember the URL of the event website where people can go to get more information or to buy a ticket to register? 30igala.com. So .au. .au, there you go. Well, see, I was... No. <laughs> Try it again. So, so yeah, so 30igala.com.au is the place to go to get a ticket and to uh, help celebrate the 30th anniversary of the internet in Australia. Alex, that's a wrap. Thank you very much.